Do you ever feel overwhelmed by your garden, particularly at this time of year, in late spring, early summer, when everything is growing and the leaves are appearing on the trees and the weeds are everywhere? I know I do, and so I'm going to share some tips for staying on top of the garden. And also, we'll have an update on the difficult shady corner and the two little patches of mini meadow that I'm growing in the front garden. It's Alexandra from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and it's the late spring garden tour and we are having a very late spring. Although we've had some lovely sunny days, we've had no rain at all, and sometimes we've had close to freezing almost every night. Although the blossom is coming out on the trees, I've been photographing it in the morning and being able to see my breath in the air and a faint dusting of frost on the lawn. I'll put links to any resources I mention in the description below, and there'll also be timestamps, so if there's a particular part of the video you'd like to jump to, then just click on the time and you'll get straight there. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads once a week with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. And if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, click the subscribe button. They're absolutely free. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when there's a new video uploaded, then click the notifications bell. Because everything's growing, it's really worth making a list at this time of year, even if you're not normally a list maker. Although I have to admit that once I'd made the list, I felt even more overwhelmed. I'll just give you a taste of it here. It starts with check the weather reports, because until our frosts have ended, we can't plant out tender seedlings. The dahlias are just coming through in pots in the potting shed uh, and they won't be ready to plant out for another three or four weeks. But I have been growing some seedlings and I wouldn't want to plant them straight out from the warmth of the potting shed, ha ha, to an absolutely freezing temperatures in the ground. Weeding is a very important thing at this time of year because the weeds really are growing. And while weeding, it's also important to have a look for self seeders and to make a decision about them. I tend to find I'm a bit late with my weeding, which also means that a lot more self-seeding plants can come in my garden, and that does look gorgeous. But you do have to slightly sort the difference from the self-seeders that you want and the weeds you don't want. And then there's the pots. I'm a great believer in low maintenance pots, which means evergreens and shrubs and things like formiums that really don't need much attention. They do need feeding and watering during the summer. But otherwise, provided you change their soil once a year, you don't really have to do anything to them. There's no deadheading. However, you do have to change the soil once a year. And now is when you do it. I have actually got some formiums here and I changed the soil last year and they look really healthy. And then there's these red leaf formiums which look pretty sick and I didn't change the soil last year. So I think it's pretty clear I can't get out of this job. And finally, is the mini meadow getting away from me. I've taken some expert advice. Jane Moore, head gardener at Bath Priory Hotel and author of Planting for Wildlife and Planting for Butterflies is going to join me later on to tell you what you need to do for your mini meadow in late spring. Just looking at this list though does make me feel overwhelmed. And a few years ago, I qualified as an accredited coach for writers. And on this coaching training, I learned that one of the most valuable things you can tell people to help them manage what seems like an unmanageable pile of tasks is to suggest that they chunk it down. And chunk it down obviously means dividing it up into tasks or timeframes that are easier to do. And the first way of chunking it down in the garden is to look at your list and to find something that is just one task and do just that in a day. For me, it was clearing the clutter in that difficult shady corner. A few weeks ago, I did a video about what I could do with a shady corner that had got terribly overgrown and then got terribly cluttered. And I have finally made my decision, which is I'm going to do the minimum. I'm going to put a table and chairs there and I'm going to do some planting. But of course it had to be cleared of its clutter first. So I just thought, OK, I'm just going to do one job today and that's clear the clutter from the difficult shady corner. A few days later, my job was I'm going to buy the silver birch tree I want to plant there and plant it. I didn't make myself do any other gardening tasks on that particular day. And actually, I do feel more in control. The second way of chunking it down in terms of gardening is to do it by time. So what I always do is I set the timer on my phone for 15 minutes and then I do 15 minutes of a particular job. And particularly if it's a job I really hate, like weeding or tidying the potting shed. And I just do it for 15 minutes. I mean, we have all can find 15 minutes in our day, I think. And at the end of that 15 minutes, off I go. And I don't do it again, possibly... I'll do the same job again, perhaps later on in the day and maybe the following day. 
Of course, there are lots of gardening jobs that take more than 15 minutes, but you'd be surprised at how those 15 minutes add up. For example, if I was going to be weeding a border and I did exactly 15 minutes one morning and then another 15 minutes in the afternoon and another 15 minutes the following day, and maybe just fit it in 15 minutes a day for a week, that's an hour and three quarters of weeding and that's going to make quite an impact on any middle-sized garden. And then the third way of chunking it down for gardening is to divide your garden into high maintenance and low maintenance areas. We have one big sunny border in the middle and that's where I put the perennials that need division and the plants that need deadheading and I've got the roses that need a certain amount of pruning and I put in annuals and also that's where the self-seeders really help take a lot of the planting tasks off me. But on the north side of the garden we've got this really easy low maintenance shady bed and it's got shrubs and it's got trees mainly and if you stick to shrubs and trees and some perennials you'll really have much less work than if you have a border that's full of annuals or full of plants that need constant deadheading or pruning or training or anything like that. So if you divide your garden into low maintenance and high maintenance areas then that's a very good way of dealing with it. And it's exactly the same with pots. I've mentioned that I always have low maintenance pots, evergreens and shrubs and then there'll be a few pots that have flowers but the other thing with pots to keep them low maintenance is have a few large ones rather than lots of little ones or if you've got lots of little ones then at least group them all together so that you can water them and feed them really in one sort of fly past as it were and what about weeding well apart from chunking it down there's also the problem of perennial weeds that are really difficult to get rid of and in this garden it's ground elder over in the difficult shady corner, while the corner was not really being used or planted, I put a weed suppressant membrane across it and it was there for a whole year and it really got rid of a lot of ground elder, although I don't wholly trust it not to come back. However, you don't want to put a weed suppressant membrane on one of your borders for an entire year unless it's in a corner that no one's really looking at. So I picked up a tip from Nick Bailey's Instagram feed. Nick Bailey is a gardening presenter and broadcaster and I'll put a link to his Instagram feed in the description below. And what he had done is to completely dig out a border, all the plants and a, you know about a foot of soil, to pick through the soil, take all the roots out and then to return the soil to the border and also the perennial plants that he wanted. Of course you really do have to pick amongst the roots of those perennial plants because the ground elder gets everywhere. Now I'm usually a no-dig gardener but I did actually feel that with this incredibly crowded bed that I really needed to do that. The one thing I have to be aware of is that I'm going to now have to keep it watered during the summer because those roots have been taken out of their ready established bed and they won't take up water so well. So soil back, plants back, water well and then add a layer of mulch or garden compost to help keep the water in and to feed the soil. However, the main way of dealing with weed overwhelm is to let go of the idea of perfection. There'll always be weeds and sometimes they'll bring you wonderful surprises, either because they themselves are very pretty or because you'll also get some very pretty self-seeders. Round about this time of year, in late spring, early summer, you'll start to see that the plants have their individual leaves so you can recognise them. Now, I'm not a botanist and so it's hard for me to recognise plants but the way I do it is that I look at the leaf and then I think well what else is like that in the garden and actually I've now realised of course it's likely to be the plant right next door to the seedling because if you look at this little seedling here I first thought it might be a seedling from an elder that we've got right across the garden so I went off and got a leaf of that and lined it up and it was quite like it but it, it wasn't exactly the same and then I looked up and realised that this little seedling is beside a tree which is called an ornamental cherry or prunus snow goose and it has identical leaves and as they say the apple never falls far from the tree. And these red leaves are quite distinctively the Cotinus grace. Now our Cotinus grace is, is probably on its way out so I will need another one and one that's actually grown from the start in our soil will do very well but I'm not going to leave this here because it's very close to the path and the Cotinus gets very large so I'll pot it up and grow it on and maybe it'll be there to step into the shoes of its parent tree if the parent tree dies in a few years time. And now for the mini meadow at the front this does seem to be getting away from me 
While some neighbours clearly think we just haven't kept up with the weeding, other people are saying that they think it looks really pretty and that they love seeing long grass around tulips. But I wasn't sure whether this long grass was actually meadow grass or not. So I asked Jane Moore, head gardener at Bath Priory Hotel and author of Planting for Wildlife and Planting for Butterflies, what I should do to the meadow in the next month. Jane pointed out that patches of wild meadow look very good when they're properly differentiated from other parts of the garden. So I feel that what I can do with this row of tulips and with the roses that will come after it is to weed out the meadow grass and any weeds and make this a distinct border, which it always was before. And then the meadow grass will be a distinctly shaped patch of grass. That'll look much more deliberate and people will be much more aware that we haven't just stopped looking after our garden. And it also will give me the chance to feed the roses properly and to feed the bulbs properly because both tulips and roses do need some extra feed for them to flower again next year. And now over to Jane who's talked to me by Zoom on what else to do in the mini meadow in the next 28 days. I think knock back any areas of really vigorous grass, whether you're doing that by hand or with something larger, you know. I think... Um, uh, you could do some seed sowing now um, because obviously this is a lovely seed sowing time of year. So whether you want to do some things like some annuals like corn cockle or something like that, uh, you might do quite well. As I say, I do really well with plugs this time of the year, really well, but they're not always that easy to get a hold of. Otherwise, I would go for smaller pots, something like seven centimetre, nine centimetre pots, um, because doing big ones actually doesn't seem worthwhile you know so doing the smaller ones the other thing I would really suggest is that if you are going to do some specific areas of planting or some sp specific planting do it in a in a in a location do it in one area partly so you can keep an eye on them partly so that if we do end up with a continuingly dry spring you can water and you've only got one section to sort of really watch out for a water also as time goes on you will see how those plants actually spread through your meadow and what's happened with us with the cowslips um, I learned this basically by accident because the cowslips arrived in a particularly dry spring and I thought crikey what am I going to do this is going to be really problematic to water so we put them in one very defined area that I could basically reach a sprinkler to if I needed to and I did only once but you know it was enough but what was interesting after that was to watch the migration over the then then years of the uh, cowslips through the meadow and how they have migrated and um, uh, well not migrated established and expanded their area and it's really there's something really satisfying in watching that happen it's a meadow making is a slow burn uh, form of gardening and actually there's something really you know when you've been gardening for quite a long time like we have you there's something really satisfying in actually watching nature sort of take its course and just giving it a little bit of a helping hand you know with a border you're in control aren't you pretty much you know okay you may lose a few things and some things do better than others but you are actually sort of controlling it but with a meadow it's more like you're nudging it in various directions really and sometimes some things you know I put in um we have a slightly shady area under some trees and I put in some red campions some nine centimeter pots of red campions about half a dozen of them and they did I thought did really well and they lasted for something like four years they gradually got smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually just faded away and you know there's nothing you can do about that it, it wasn't quite damp enough it was shady enough but it wasn't quite damp enough for them I think and so they just didn't like it very much at all uh, we've been trying to encourage teasels because, of course, teasels are great for slightly dry, slightly sunny. And we put in some little plug plants that we'd grown ourselves. And um, I think I managed to get one teasel to flower that first sort of, well, their biennial. So the second year, one teasel flowered. Last year, I probably had half a dozen. So they're gradually sort of improving, you know, and increasing. And I have known things almost die out completely. And then to sort of pop back up, there's a particular season that they will think, oh, this is this is my weather. 
And and that's the quite. I think that's one of the interesting things about Meadow is that you're never quite in control of it. It's more that you're just sort of pushing it in various directions and trying things. So um, so going back to it, I would just probably just pop in a few sort of annuals, maybe some little plug plants. Things that we do really well with are things like um, nautia. You know, nautias and um, scabious are really good because they make really nice sort of clumps um, once they've established. So that's a really good thing to plant in in sort of nine centimetre pots and just put, you know, as I say, just put sort of half a dozen in and see how they go. So letting a patch of your lawn run to mini meadow is great for wildlife, but it's not completely no effort. A friend of mine who does this very successfully, and there's a video about her lawn called How to Make a Mini Wildlife Meadow in the description below. And she says, it's, it's still work, it's just a different sort of work. You're not having to mow. Each month in the Garden Tips and Tours, I keep you updated with the progress of the mini meadow lawns so you can see what mistakes I'm making and pick up any tips if it's something you'd like to try yourself. And Jane's agreed to help me with giving advice every month. And you can find all the Garden Tips and Tours videos in the Garden Tips and Tours playlist at the end of this video. And if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden, then do subscribe to the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.